contrastingly, if it's awful conditions or freezing cold or really windy, it can just be like pushing a boulder up a hill and it's just, you're just like, why am I here? And it's just trying it's to- It's only 8.30. Yeah, well, you're almost finished by the time it's okay. 8.30. So you start at 7.30 and we get it, we finish between like nine and 9.15. Right. And then after that, it's really important to refuel properly after the session. So um, I know yeah, you talked a little diet, yeah. yeah, so I know you talked a little bit about the ketogenic diet, but right. rowing training is like quite a mixture of high intensity and um, low in, lower intensity stuff, as well as a lot of strength training. It's it's a pretty unique, unique sport in that you've got to have a really big endurance base, but also quite a big power component right. as well, um, rather than being like a pure power or a pure endurance athlete. So um, I definitely ate what I would call like a normal mi- mixed diet. Um, and because I was uh, doing lightweight rowing, I had to like just be quite mindful and aware of what calories I was putting in my body and making sure that I gave my body like enough carbohydrate to rebuild my glycogen stores and enough protein to make sure that I maintained lean mass. And um, the nutritionist was very much of the the school of thought that fat was something that should be minimized. Hmm. And I actually ended up in a bit of an interesting position where I was at least as educated in some aspects of nutrition and some aspects of physiology as right. the physiologists and the nutritionists. Obviously they were world leaders in terms of applied nutrition and physiology, but I had kind of my own ideas and one, and it, I think informed by our, formed by my own thesis. research. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I think it was pretty unique that I was able to go and sit with them and like chew over the different ideas. Like, why can I not like do this with my diet? Or what do you think about if I did this? So or, what was that? What was that standard protocol for, from the, from their side? Was it just like a for higher, nutrition? Yeah. It was sort of like post session, like 1.2 grams of carbs per, per kilo body weight, like, okay. like carb, not overload, but de- like pretty uh, heavy on carbon, pretty heavy. Yeah. And, but on they protein. would definitely steer us towards like more, um, like less processed foods and the right. food we had an absolutely fantastic chef on site who would just get me like, so we'd talk about recipes. I get so excited about what he was going to cook and taking it home and trying it myself. And he's, um, he's been like a real inspiration to me, like, uh, with my own diet, the, the sort <laughs> okay. of recipes that he'd produce yeah. out and feed like the athletes. And I think if you enjoy your food, you get a lot more out of it. So, right. um, it definitely wasn't too, um, too keto, the diet, right. it was much more, uh, geared towards, you're like uh, providing carbohydrate for yeah. exercise. I, mean, I think that's an interesting point because I think that, uh, like, I, I ne- never want to be ultra dogmatic and for like keto is best for everyone for every single use case. Like, it's just not right. Yeah. I think for a lot of weight loss and potentially for, uh, you know, keto is interesting, right? Like, I think we have to be thoughtful around the trade off. Yeah. I think, yes, ketogenic diets are good in, in some aspects because you're taking 90% fat, like, you're reducing insulin response because you're not taking protein, you're not taking carbohydrates. But that also means you're having potentially elevated cholesterol, elevated free fatty acids, which can backfire in some cases as, as well. The good thing. Um, so yeah, I'm curious from your perspective, like what you know, what would you recommend uh, in a, a, a people for uh, to do keto for? What use cases would those look like versus like a normal blended diet or a standard diet? Like, what would you, like, if you were to characterize in in broad buckets, how would you describe different, like, macronutrient blends for certain use cases? Yeah, I mean, that's quite quite a big and complicated question. Um, I think that the sort of people that would benefit from experimenting, at least with a ketogenic diet, are the people that are already on their way to insulin resistance and who have not, who have been um, frequently during the day and to high levels consuming carbohydrate to the point where they're pushing their body towards like having a metabolic syndrome and AKA diabetes. Yeah. You know, like, and there's a really interesting, um, school of thought coming around at the moment, uh, about defining the terms that we talk about obesity. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, up until now we talk about people being overweight or underweight when actually weight isn't really the important thing. This is, um, researchers or, um, a school of thought that's this school of thought is now being put forward by Phil Maffetone and Paul Larson. They're suggesting that we, rather than talk about whether people are overweight or underweight, we talk about them being over fat or under fat because mm. it's not BMI, um, body mass index, doesn't take into account whether you've got so I, some sometimes athletes have really high BMI and they're overweight because but they're, they're just all muscle. Yeah, exactly. Muscle, yeah. So they're trying to change the language that we talk about. Um, you know size and health right right? so if you're over fat you might not look be or be overweight but you might have you know visceral adiposity visceral fat that's causing you like metabolic damage um 
and not be overweight. Yeah, I mean, so, I think part of part of that reason is because it's simple to do height and weight. Yeah. But like, yeah, I mean, we do DEXA scans to tell our body fat percentage that actually measures our yeah visceral adipose tissue. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think those. So I think for, for sure. people who who are on that sort of spectrum, like metabolic syndrome type thing, the keto diet is w- trying to go on that for six months or a right. year or you know or even long term that would be really useful for them because it would involve a lot of education and addressing a lot of the eating patterns that they right. may have developed that would be uh, detrimental to their health right. so i think that's one use case where it's got like an instant application that could really could really be transformative and even if they experiment with it for six weeks or well, you'd probably want to go a little bit longer than that to give yourself some time to adapt but even if you do it for six months and you really don't get on with it you might find that your some of the unhelpful eating patterns have changed. And so um, I have like family members who had like blood tests that were like perhaps a little bit wor- worrying. They talked to me about the diet and I was like, well, you know, read Tim Noakes's book, The Real Meal Revolution, or like read up a little bit about this like lower carbohydrate way of living. And now they, they experimented going properly keto probably didn't need to in such an extreme way because they weren't they're not like as big as a house and right. and eating that unhealthy probably but, keto is a 90 percent fat yeah they like, did like they had a full out, had like an experiment but it was probably a bit much right so now but now their eating patterns are much more like mindful and probably a lot less um you know unhealthy than right. they were before so even a period of experimentation with a diet like that can change your habits and so you may for example if you wanted to be more thoughtful now at least yeah exactly. even then that's like probably correlated towards or a causative towards like healthier lifestyle. Ex- exactly right. so i think it's um it's a useful tool and some people will get on really well with it and stay right. on it long term and some people might experiment come off but have come out with some right. like with some plus points from having yeah. done it um I think there's an interesting school of thought about whether it would be useful for endurance athletes or not. The research is really inconclusive. So even as recently as like this Christmas, a really big study was published that um, showed that being a following a low carb diet didn't decrease performance, but didn't improve performance. So um, there's like people going backwards and forwards and it's quite a controversy in the sport world at the moment because there's a lot of athletes, um, who come out with anecdotal evidence being like, yeah, I've gone keto, ultra endurance athletes this is. So athletes that compete in events that last many hours long. um, They, some of them come out with stories being like, I've gone on keto, it's really, really made a difference. And then some athletes try it and just can't get on with it. So again, it's a case of like looking at your own individual use case. Um, The science is inconclusive at the moment. So off the back of this study, um, that was done in race walkers by uh, Louise Burke's lab in Australia. They're now running a second one, I believe, where they're looking at low carb diet and then refeeding with carbohydrate. So right before ma- exactly, so so everything double. is just like way more subtle than we know right now. Right. This field is um, rapidly exploding, and then you've kind of got the potential of having exogenous ketones added in on That's top of what that I was gonna as ask well. You, you I know, think like, your your like, research, which is. Uh, you're on a normal diet and then you or, or or you basically turbo load with both exogenous ketones and glucose yeah and that has shown to actually improve performance so that's the so i love really... to yeah, hear about yeah, the exciting research that you guys have been doing yeah so we published a paper last summer and it was kind of like the culmination of all of the work that i've been uh you know i definitely was not the superstar researcher here like pete cox really spearheaded that and we had a massive team of people kind of collaborating helping to collect the data and analyze it um but i was i was a part of it um it was a fantastic story where we just did loads and loads of exercise tests with athletes uh with different combinations of either ketone on exogenous ketones by themselves compared with carbohydrate and we saw that ketones and carbs were both kind of equivalent in terms of performance um and then we saw, well, actually, to kind of take one step back, the first thing we did was give ketones and show that if you exercise, the body burns ketones. So um, that was kind of interesting because some of the previous research had suggested that um, exogenous ketones weren't be bur- being burnt as much during exercise. But right. a lot of that work was done in people who were starved, so they didn't have replete muscle glycogen as whereas when we were giving it when athletes were fully fed we were seeing that athletes were able to use ketones as a fuel then we showed that ketones and carbohydrates were kind of equivalent and we went a lot deeper into the metabolism that was kind of going on in the cells we did this technique called metabolomics which is where you take a muscle sample and then analyze all of the different metabolites going on and it's not um 
it's a bit of a snapshot so it doesn't necessarily give you like flux through different pathways and things like that but it kind of gives you some indications of what's going on inside inside your muscle when you're exercising when you've got right. ketones and there's lots of different things that are happening that are potentially like benefiting performance so keep these exogenous ketones were slowing the body's need to use glycogen so glycogen use when the, the body had ketones was was lower so that potentially we didn't measure um sort of like subsequent performance after these trials but in theory you're then like burning less glycogen and you've got it left over for either if the race was to go on for longer or if you were to going to do a repeat performance after a couple of hours it kind of your recovery is faster but potentially your right. recovery could be faster um, the other thing we saw was that the num- amount of branched chain amino acids in the muscle was lower when ketones were also kind of in the mix as well and that's all of the- these two things that we've just discussed that kind of uh, is linked to ketones evolutionary role as the like substrate to the for the body to use when it's starving so if you were starving you wouldn't want your pro- muscle protein to be broken down because if your muscle protein breaks down you die pretty pretty quickly and also you want to hold on to any carbohydrate reserves you've got for right. as long as possible so um these two things like fitted really nicely with the evolutionary story that kind of goes with ketone bodies and then sort of the final study that was published there uh, in our paper was looking at performance so we kind of had all these hints of metabolism it's interesting another thing that we saw was that blood lactate levels was lo- were lower and that was kind of a bit of a indication that um the body was chewing through carbohydrates yeah. slower it sort of kind of went with the glycogen story but um it's also uh, interesting from a practical perspective because lactic acid is what makes your muscles throughout the work there's some that. really interesting data about like lactic acid and recovery right. it's like it used to be like really really red that that was the case and now right. i think um so it's, people... so it's more subtle then yeah okay. like um so i think when they do whole body experiments lactic acid can um build up definitely can impair like performance and that's why so as a member of the rowing team i always really really struggled with this clearing lactate after a big um, session so mm. we would finish our sessions they would take a ear prick blood sample and measure the lactate and i used to produce a lot of lactate have very high blood lactate levels even sometimes like 20 millimolar mm. which is which is very high if they picked you up with that on the street they'd probably think you're about to die let's just say and then we would have to do rec- active recovery so they right. would make us go and like um, sit on a bicycle or walk or run and or like get out. in a cold shower mm-hmm. yeah things to try and like make the muscles clear it out right. because because in a whole body lactic acid is not the sort of thing you do want sitting around right and um, some people were really good at getting rid of it and so after an hour I would come back and I'd still be at like seven or eight millimoles and they'd send me off and I'd have to go again and um, it used to really upset me because I used to give people um, sweeties if they got their blood lactate below two and I never ever could get my blood lactate back, back below two anyway that's an aside right. so in a whole body lactic acid um, potentially a bad thing but when they've done experiments in cells they've actually seen that it's not the lactic acid itself that's um, the harmful thing that it might be other things that are kind of hmm. consequence of exercise. I mean, this is something that I need to do a little bit more reading about myself and tease out the subtleties because okay. I think it's... Um, think- well, at least it's definitely a sign that you're not burning through carbs as heavily. It's definitely yeah. a sign that you're doing yeah less right. glycolysis. So that's that's um, the interesting kind yeah. of... But before we were about to tease that aside, you're about to say that like the, in- the last interesting result... Was the per- time performance. So right. we, we've got glycogen sparing and a decreased protein breakdown and lower levels of blood lactate. And all of this kind of converged to, to mean that the body could uh, perform better. So the athletes did 60 minutes of a fixed intensity work. And this was all standardized to their own like individual maximum work. Um, that it was quite a high intensity work. It's so the cycling. It's like, yeah, cycling on an uh, indoor bike. Right, and these are all like former Olympians. Oh, uh, like pretty elite level athletes. Right. Um, not necessarily, not all of them Olympians, but like we had like level. A, we had a pretty thorough screening process and we right. always tried to recruit the best people and the most reliable people that you can because if you're doing a science study where you're going to take invasive muscle biopsies and do expensive analysis and use expensive keto nester, you need to have people that you trust are repeatable. Right. And um, the more a uh, higher level an athlete is statistically, it's been shown the more repeatable they are of performances. So right. if you had like lower level athletes and you were getting improvements in performance, a certain like amount. Like me, it's like a, certain amount like a good day for me, like yeah. I'm probably varying like 10%. Yeah, right? Just exactly. like, oh, I feel really good today. Exactly. Right. So we wanted people, I know, I know as an athlete that I could reliably put out X, Y, or Z performance. And right. so you want people that that can do that for right. you. So yes, we did have like really good level athletes and it was a real... Um, a real fun study to run when you work with people who are kind of like like-minded like that right. but um so these athletes they do 60 minutes at a fixed intensity and then we say 30 minutes as hard as you can and record how far they can go and i mean like it was pretty impressive to watch how hard i mean i, I can push myself hard but it's a bit 